Hello, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are in the world, uh, and welcome to our next event within the A Plus Lectures program. Let me say that this lecture is a special one for us because we are, are meeting a renowned researcher in um, emergency medicine. I will introduce uh, Rama uh, in a minute. I will introduce you in a minute. But let mm -hmm. me just say a few words about the program itself. So the program, which is called A Plus Lectures, uh, aims at uh, uh, expanding and um, proliferating, or I, I should probably say, um, you know, extending the knowledge of scientists to the general public, but also interested scientists and students. Now, this is the fourth lecture in within the new edition, and this new edition is taking uh, place today, so on the 16th of November 2021. Now, this event tonight is available through our Click Meeting platform and also in this broadcast through uh, YouTube. And I would like to uh, welcome everyone here tonight to this, uh, to this event tonight. Today's lecture, titled Treating Diseases by Treating Mechanical Dysfunction, uh, will be held and delivered by Dr. Ramaswamy Krishnan of the Emergency Medicine Harvard Medical School, so, Dr. Krishnan, good evening, I mean, or good afternoon in your case. And let me just say that Dr. Krishnan is a bioengineering, bioengineering uh, engineer, excuse me, focused on discovery and treatment of respiratory mm -hmm. problems of vital importance to emergency medicine. Um, uh, in sepsis and acute lung injury, he studies how the pulmonary endothelium accurately disrupts and dysfunctions. In asthma and COPD, he studies how the airways accurately narrow to impose breathing difficulties. He's also engaged in translating his basic science discoveries into new medications. Rama, this is really a pleasure to have you here tonight. And I would like you to uh, I would like to say that we are really happy that this bridge between Poland and America is a strong one, becoming probably even stronger due to this event tonight. And uh, let me give the floor to you, Rama. I hope you will enjoy this uh, lecture, everyone. Uh, I have only one technical uh, thing that I would like to mention tonight. Uh, those people who joined us through Click Meeting platform, you can ask your questions using the chat box, which is uh, down there. And uh, the questions that you ask will be then um, read out by myself. And then uh, Dr. Krishnan will answer those questions at the end of the lecture. Um, also, people throughout who, who have joined us through YouTube, you're also welcome to ask any questions through your chat, your public chat. Uh, which is available through your YouTube platform as well. Um, let me say that today's lecture is a special one because it's also a technical um, lecture, well, uh, going into details about um, this mechanical dysfunction and treating diseases, as the title suggests. And uh, Rama, would you be so kind as to bring the topic closer to us, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um <coughs> Mukashik for introducing me and for this opportunity to present. I'm really looking forward to it. All right, so let me um, begin by um, disclosing first my commercial interests. I've co-founded several companies uh, and I also consult for other companies, but I want to reassure you that none of this is going to impact the science that I'm about to present to you today. So um, I'm an engineer, I like exercises, so what I thought I would do is I will start with a simple exercise. And here's what we're, we're all going to do together. When I count to three, I want all of us in this call with me to take a single deep breath. All right. So when I count to three, one, two, three, please. That feels good, right? <laughs> so it turns out we do that, a breath or a sigh, every six minutes or so. This is normal human physiology. And every time I do that, 
my airways that can sometimes narrow will immediately enlarge, will dilate. In fact, of all natural strategies that your body uses for keeping the airways open, that deep breath you took is amongst the most potent strategy. However, if you have asthma, this effect fails. A deep breath does not dilate the asthmatic airway. Now, this is not my discovery. This has been known for, well, it's been experienced by asthmatics for, you know, as long as asthma has been around, but it's known by scientists for upwards of 150 years. And they've discovered important roles for airway smooth muscle mass, airway smooth muscle tone, contraction, but a mechanism of why is, what is this all about? And why is it different between normal and asthma has remained elusive. Let's look at this problem again, but this time, let's look directly at a human airway of a precision cut lung slice. So this is a slice of a human lung. It's about 200 microns thick. And we've placed the slice on a membrane in a substrate. We come to methods later. But for now, this is a lung slice that's living. That's the airway. Inside is the epithelium. Around this stuff, that's the airway smooth muscle. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that slice and run an experiment. And I want all of you to keep your eyes on the airway, okay? So I'm going to play a movie, watch the airway. Oh, I'm sorry. So here we go. First, I add methacholine, which is a constrictor. You can see the airway is narrow. And then we will superimpose breathing. What I hope you noticed was when we added methacholine, the airways became smaller, but with breathing, they started getting bigger, bigger, bigger. And in fact, if I waited for a couple more minutes, you would see this would return back to the pre-constriction baseline. Don't take my word for it. I've done this experiment, many lungs, many slices, and I'm showing you now the average data. Y-axis is reversal of constriction. So how much reversal did you get from constricted state? On the X-axis, oops, is how much stretch was imposed. Don't worry about differences between curves. The message here is the more stretch you impose, 50% is like <gasps> big breath, you get complete reversal of constriction. All this however, was non-asthmatic lung slices and lungs. We have evidence, few slices from asthmatic, and here's a movie, similar experiment, and let's see what happens in an asthmatic airway of an asthmatic lung slice. Again, keep your eye there. Methacholine, you see constriction, and then breathing. That airway stays constricted. Breathing does not overcome the constricted state. Now you're probably wondering, What's going on here? What's at stake? Well, to get closer to the answer, let's go down a length scale. We started with a deep breath, we looked at lung slice, but now let's look at a cultured airway smooth muscle cell. So this is one of those cells from the lung that we've placed in culture um, on a substrate in a dish. Now, one of the interesting things about this cell or really any you know, adherent cell like this is when you put them in culture, they're not simply blobs that float around, but they're adherent. And not only are they adherent, but they also contract their substrate. For that cell, this is the map of contractile forces the cell exerts. We'll come to methods in a bit, but for now, for that cell, this is the contractile force map. The colors show you magnitude of contraction. So the really red colors, hot colors are the big contractions, black is zero. And there's also arrows here that are all pointed inwards. So this cell is on the substrate and it's contracting at its edges. Now we're gonna take that cell and do an experiment. We will impose to it a big breath and unstretch. So we would go big stretch, unstretch. And I would like for you guys to observe what happens to those contractile forces during the experiment. I'm gonna play a movie 
first couple of frames are in this region. So that's before we impose the stretch. And the rest of the frames are this region, which is after the stretch. And keep your eye on this contour. So before stretch, before stretch, immediately after stretch and with time. Let's see that again. But this time, let's be quantitative. From every one of these maps, you can get a single number of contraction. And that's the number I'm plotting here as a function of time. So I'm playing that movie again. This time, look at the graph. So pre-stretch, immediately after stretch, and time after stretch. Notice what happens soon after that stretch, the deep breath, stretch, unstretch, these forces go down by as much as 80% for that cell. And then you wait the remaining whatever 10, 15 minutes, you can see it all recovers back to baseline. Now, this already was very interesting. That's one example. But you're probably wondering, well, how do you, this is one representative movie. Can you convince me this works? Many cells, many dishes. And we did all that. We did. So we took different donors, um, uh, uh, you know, in different diseases, different days. And I'm showing you here the average data. On the y-axis is normalized contraction. So what we do is every cell, we normalize its contraction to its state before stretch. And I'm showing you how this normalized contraction changes with time after stretch. So let's go through this a little carefully. No stretch is imposed. Everything is at one, nothing happens. The cell just stays where it is. But as soon as you impose stretch, two and a half, five, ten, you can see that those forces drop dramatically. 10% stretch, it drops by about 75%. But within those remaining 10, 15 minutes, everything returns back to the pre-stretched value. Along, around the time when I was doing these experiments, my colleague at the time, Dr. Xavier Tripa, who is now a professor of bioengineering at um, the University of Barcelona, he ran similar experiments, but he was measuring cytoskeletal stiffness rather than contraction. And I'm showing you here how normalized stiffness changes with time after stretch. I plotted them side by side for a reason. The similarity is pretty striking. They, they look pretty similar. In fact, if I were to plot contraction, not as a function of time, but contraction as a function of stiffness, you get a nice linear relationship, which is to say that this contractile change is strongly linked to changes of cytoskeletal stiffness. Since we've learned at the molecular scale that these dynamics are mediated by changes in the F-actin cytoskeleton. To do this, we ran that similar single stretch experiment in cells, and then we fixed our dish of cells. So in a given, on, in a given dish, the dish is fixed here, but you have cells outside the stretch region, so that's our control, and you have cells inside the stretch region, so that's our treatment. And all you do then is you compare them. And what we observed was day and night. You, you quantitate this, many dishes, many cells. What you learn is soon after stretch, the F act inside the skeleton almost completely disappears. But if you now were to go and fix a dish there, it's all back. Unstretched looks exactly like, because everything is recovered, it looks exactly like the unstretched cells. So it quickly dissolves and then reappears. We confirmed this as well with Western blots. We measured F and G actin fractions. This is the no stretch condition. This is immediately after stretch. And look at what happens to the F actin fraction. It completely disappears. But two and a half and five minutes after, it's back. So you see this rapid depolymerization and repolymerization of F actin. We went deeper. First, we focused on an actin severing protein called cofilin. Went back to that same experiment and we stretched either control cells or cells where we knocked down cofilin. And I'm showing you here how the contractile forces change with time. Control cells, well, you do that stretch, you know that Immediately after stretch, forces go down by a huge amount, and then they recover back. That's in controls. But in the knockdown cells, they relax significantly less than controls, though they recover back to the same baseline value. So from these data, we discovered that this acute reduction of force after stretch is mediated by cofilin. 
We next focused on an actin restoring protein. So remember, cofilin is an actin severing protein. Then we, just, we, we focused on an actin restoring protein. We focused on zixin. Similar experiment and similar plot. Contractile force as a function of time. Wild type cells in blue and the zixin knockout cells in red. Now what we observed is compared to wild type in blue, the zixin knockout cells relax to a similar extent. However, they recover substantially less which is to say that the force enhancement after stretch is mediated by zixin. Now, we picked kefilin zixin sort of, well, opportunistically, but these are two amongst hundreds of redundant proteins that control actin disassembly assembly. And I want to say we've just scratched the tip of the iceberg. Additional studies need to be done to really understand how these partner with other components. But here is an assay and an important reason for studying it. All right, so just a quick summary so far. I've shown you data, the molecular scale, cellular scale, slices, and even human, that in response to a stretch, the cells acutely relax. In other studies, we have discovered that the cells also soften their cytoskeleton. They also enhance their intracellular remodeling dynamics. And in physics, this collective behavior can be called fluidization. So in response to that, my airway smooth muscle cell fluidizes. And when that happens, when this becomes really relaxed and fluidized, your airways can open. So then the, oops, then the hypothesis that we are currently testing is an asthma. It is the failure of the muscle to fluidize, which is the proximate cause of bronchoconstriction. Now, from a basic science point of view, this is already quite uh, important, interesting, exciting, and we're studying him you know, routinely. But if you have asthma, know of somebody with asthma, or you're a clinician, Knowing this is not sufficient. Obviously, you want to know, well, how do I fluidize my airway smooth muscle if I have asthma? Fortunately, we have a class of medications called bronchodilators. Unfortunately, the current medications do not reach up to 30% of people with asthma. That's about 30% of 300 million people worldwide, large number of people. Fortunately, there has been, if you have followed this field, or if you are either in the respiratory field or interested in this, there's been a lot of promising new candidates in the last 15 years or so with potentially therapeutic value in asthma as a bronchodilator. But the problem is assays to go from, well, here's my candidate to here's my drug. These bridging assays have been poor. Let me explain. So typically, let's say that you're a basic science lab like mine or pharma company, you have a candidate designed around, say, bitter taste and receptors. You have maybe 500,000 compounds, uh, chemicals. You want to know, well, which ones do I move forward to becoming a medicine? The first thing you do is what is called high throughput screening. And for bronchodilation, typically you would measure, you add your compound and see how does that change calcium signaling in cells, cyclic AMP, membrane potential. These are standard biological readouts. The problem is that these readouts can be dissociated ultimately from how does it impact various smooth muscle contractile force. And the, several examples, you know, I said bitter tastins, you can measure these readouts, but ultimately how does that relate to a reduction of force has been very difficult to understand. Now, we can directly measure contraction and in my lab and many others, uh, we've had technologies where you can measure muscle airway smooth muscle contraction. And these are three uh, standard methods. The problem is that these methods are slow. This method called atomic force microscopy, you start with the probe and you go, I mean, that's one cell. This is not, of, if you have 100,000 compounds, can you imagine one cell per treatment? Forget about it. This is not going to get you there. The low throughput. These guys, for example, magnetic twisting cytometry or all these methods, you have beads on a cell and you put it in a field. You run them one dish at a time, five dishes at a time. That is not high throughput. Typically, high throughput screening, you need 100 wells, 300 wells, 1,000 wells at the same time. So you need it to be fast in that way. And these are also complex. This method, for example, muscle on a chip, you're talking about bending of a beam. And from there, you're going to infer a contractal a contraction, that math is pretty complicated. It's not simple to understand. So ideally, you want an assay that is fast and that can directly measure contractile force. And to do that, 
we developed this method called contractile force screening. This method is fast, 96 or 384 well plates. You can run them simultaneously. It uses physiological stiffness substrates. I'll come back to this in a bit. You can directly measure force. And for those in the audience who are statistically inclined, the assay has, is of high quality. So you can come up, there is a, a, a standard statistical number called the robust Z prime factor. Anything greater than 0.5 is considered to be a good quality reproducible assay, and we exceed that. So let's take a few minutes and talk about this assay. The core method that makes it possible is the method of traction force microscopy. This starts with a substrate that is soft. And by soft, I'm talking about um, a few kilopascal. Again, to those of you who don't think, not engineers, or who don't think kilopascal on a daily basis, well, this is like stiffness of shaving foam in between your fingers or toothpaste. That's about a few kilopascal. And if you're a cell in the body, by the way, that's what you're feeling. That's your physiological stiffness, kilopascal. That's what you're probing locally. And we can make the substrate of that stiffness. But unlike toothpaste, when you when you squeeze toothpaste, you know, just or, or shaving foam, it just kind of flows away. These substrates are elastic. So what happens, you, you, if you deform them, material gets deformed. But when the cell lets go, when the force leaves, it comes back to where it started. So these substrates are elastic as well. And they're also transparent. So in the experiment, you can look through the substrate and you can look at the cells that are on top. But you can, we also have little fluorescent beads that we put right at the very top on the substrate. So with the microscope, you can look at these. And when the cell on the substrate deforms it, those beads move. And based on movement of the beads, you can get a map of displacements. How are the cells displacing the beads? Once you have a displacement map, we know the stiffness of the substrate because we manufacture them based on what we need, one kilopascal, five kilopascals. You have a displacement map, you know the stiffness, you get a contraction map. And this is, you know, less than a second implementation of a standard program, which we have des described and which is also available. So you just go from a displacement map to a force map. And when you get a map like this, you can do mean, median, whatever, but simple thing, just an average, for, average value per map. And that's what's measured. In a typical experiment, you measure this value pre-treatment and you measure it after treatment. And all you do is a simple ratio, force, post-treatment divided by force pre-treatment. And that's all we need to know. And we call that the force response ratio. Here are some examples. This is a dish of cells um, at baseline with an average force of 38 Pascal. We treated them with the vehicle control. This is what the drugs are mixed in and our expectation of this should do nothing. And after about an hour of treatment, forces stay at 38 Pascal. Response ratio is one, no effect. Excellent, the drug has no effect on contractile force. That's it. And here are some other examples. This is a contractant, fetal bovine serum, goes from 26 to 40, bigger than one, contractant. Another compound, 21 to six, less than one, relaxant. That's it. So all you need to know is this force response ratio. You immediately understand the characteristic of the compound. So that's the fundamental process. So now we have an, we have an assay. The first thing we need to do, of course, is to validate the assay. I mean, does it work? And we start with known compounds. We went further. We said, let's pick known compounds for bronchodilation, but also pick four compounds that are structurally similar. So same family, a family of compound compounds called beta agonists. This is what is currently used. If you look at people taking puffs in asthma, this is a major part of that puff, the beta agonist. And these four compounds are all in one form of the other in clinical use. So we said, let's take these four closely related compounds in a 96 well plate, let's put them side by side, different doses, let's scatter them there, let's also do multiple plates, and let's see how well can this assay predict a reproducible response. So we took them, different doses, multiple plates, and I'm showing you next the average results. On the y-axis is that force response ratio that I told you about, that single number that tells you about the compound. X-axis is dose. This is for Motrol, Salmetrol, Iso, and Salbutamol. Curves on top, 15 minutes of treatment, curves and bottom is 30 minutes of treatment. Here's the data after an hour at 15 and 30 minutes of treatment. Exciting because first, when you increase the dose, you see more the response ratio is smaller and smaller, which is to say these are relaxants. So there's more and more relaxation. And also, if you notice, each one of these is a 
mean and a standard error across eight different wells across multiple plates. And many cases, you don't see error bars, which is, which is you know, a fabulous news to people who do drug discovery because that shows that the data is reproducible. So we get both of those characteristics, nice dose curve, also really tight data. Now, from each of these curves, you can get a value, what's called the IC50. What is the dose when you get a 50% of response? And that's what I'm showing you here, the IC50 for these four compounds. And this is a measure of how potent is the compound. And then based on that, we rank ordered them. And what I want you to take away is, before we started this experiment, that is what you would have expected from studies previously done in mouse or human uh, studies. This is the order of potency of the four compounds. And our assay recapitulated it. So this was very important. OK, so now we have an assay that's validated. We said, let's go screen. But again, this was 2015-ish. The um, lab was not a screening lab at all. We are, we are and still are. And we are an engineering lab. So we said, let's start small, 1,000 compounds. But we picked an interesting library. In this library, every compound is in human use for one disease or another, not as, just asthma, cancer, bladder dysfunction, regardless. Every compound here is FDA approved for human use. And our rationale was perhaps we might find a compound that we can repurpose for asthma, because then we can short circuit many of the developmental stages. We might see something really uh, new, ready to repurpose. So we took these compounds in mixtures of four, and I'm showing you here raw results. On the y-axis is that force response ratio, and this is a bar, each bar represents a one mixture of four compounds. And that it is. What we did is we picked a cutoff and we focused on those that were below the cutoff because these are the potential relaxing compounds. Focused on these red bars. And remember each red bar is four compounds, deconvoluted, tested again, repeated the process. At the end of it, we found about 15 compounds ready for bronchodilation and asthma. Except that all 15 compounds were already either known to be used or in use for asthma. Still, it was an important exercise and it validated our approach for primary screening. So this was really very, again, very important step for us. So now we went bigger. So we started 1,000, now we went 10,000. And this library is a library of chemical matter. So this is no known relationship to muscle or asthma. Anything we discover here can potentially be a novel hit for asthma. So what we did here, we took these 10,000 compounds, eight compounds per mixture, 35 mixtures per plate, four plates a day, three times a week. We screened this library in, in, a, in a month. And here's the, the raw data results. Force response ratio for each of those mixtures. So we similarly picked a cutoff, focused on the, the red bars that are below the cutoff, deconvoluted, repeated. And now we detected some novel hits for muscle relaxation, but no previously known relationship. So this was exciting, uh, additionally exciting in this way, because these are potentially new medications. But when you get results like this, the very first thing you want to do is confirm that this is not toxic. Um, so we ran standard toxicity assays. Um, this is the vehicle control in the assay measurement. And these are for three, three doses of the first hit, three doses of our second hit. Very similar. This is not causing any toxicity to our cells. We also got nice dose response curves to the compound and did some additional characterization. And this was all 2015. And a lot has happened since. Enabled by these data, a team of investigators between my lab, University of Chicago, North, Northwestern, um, we are now collectively funded by the National Institute of Health. We're collectively developing a new class of medications called asthma, called remodulants. And this is based on really improvements on uh, a compound improvements on this initial discovery. So this has led to um, development of a new class of medication. So. So far, I've, de I've described to you a method to directly measure force. We start at 1,000, we went 10,000, and now we have some other capacity. We've enhanced our capacity. We can go up to a million compounds now with our approaches. I've explained to you how this has led to the development of remodulants. I want to take a few minutes to talk about a new collaboration that has emerged with Dr. Kirk Drewy's lab at the National Institute of Health. Dr. Drewy's lab has recently put forth a really nice striking hypothesis for fungal asthma. They have discovered that these, the fungal proteas, the fungal allergen 
can directly infiltrate can uh, can infiltrate the uh, bronchial epithelium and directly attack the airway smooth muscle cell. And when it does that, it causes the muscles to contract, hypercontract. And when that happens, the airway constricts. And this is an exciting new way of how we can think about this pathology of fungal asthma. I'm excited to say that with this contractile for screening assay, we could recapitulate some of these effects. Contraction, no allergen with allergen. This alpine is the allergen, fungal protease, fungal protease of the, off the allergen. Zero, and this is with protease. Just for the moment, focus on this. With the addition, the airway smooth muscle hypercontracts, exactly as was in, in accordance with that hypothesis. We also have some positive controls, which we can go into if needed. What's important is this was done in a 96 well plate using this method of contractile for screening. So now, given these positive data, our ongoing studies, in ongoing studies, we are using the SAS to screen for new and novel inhibitors of allergen-induced muscle contraction in the settings of fungal asthma. We're also using this assay for other bronchodilation discovery, drug discovery studies. In one case, we're focused on G-protein coupled receptors, and we're looking at it to optimize compounds that target the receptor. In another study, we're looking at um, targeting the actin cytoskeleton as a means to bring about bronchodilation. We're also looking at more broad pathways in cells, for example, using targeting the mevalonate pathway using statins as a means to induce bronchodilation or targeting the NF-cap-B inhibitory pathway called A20 as a means to, to cause dilation. So what's important to appreciate is many different mechanisms for bronchodilation, but this approach of contractile for screening is in sense, they can, it can study them all using this one assay. It's not target specific, but it's phenotype specific. So it can give you a good readout on the endpoint that you're of, of your therapeutic intent. Now, contraction isn't limited to muscle, uh, to the airway smooth muscle or to the settings of asthma. It's relevant in the liver, in the kidney, and in the heart, something I'll come back to towards the end of my presentation. But this assay has now garnered quite a lot of applications. So that's everything about cultured cells at the moment. As these assays were being built and developed, we wondered, can we use these measurements or can we translate these measurements to the airway smooth muscle that's in the intact area of the human lung slice. So can we implement them directly in the human airway or in the setting? But first there was a logistical problem. My lab or my group of labs around here, we typically get one to three human lungs a year, lungs, lungs a year. These are typically transplanted, discarded lungs. So we would get access to them. We get along all hands on board, slice, slice, slice. You can get up to, in fact, recently up to a thousand slices at a time. So lots of slices. Slices, each slice can live in culture for up to even a month. But in a typical experiment, we maybe use 25, 50. And there was a time when we were throwing away like precious slices, which was crazy. I mean, here we are, we have, we've been waiting months, we got our human lung and we're throwing away these precious slices. So to solve this problem of limited samples, we devised the method of cryopreservation. For those in the audience who've ever been to a biology lab, if you've ever frozen, cells, the method is precisely the same. Take slices, drop them in a medium with 10% DMSO, Mr. Frosty, and then it goes to liquid nitrogen. On the day of the experiment, rapidly thaw the slice, place them in medium, and proceed. And we've confirmed that this preserves viability of the lung slices. Importantly for us, it preserves contractile function of the airways. And we've used this to generate banks with mouse, rat, pig, and even human. And we've thought them out days, months uh, after when we use them on demand. So we have slices. But then the important question is, can you measure mechanics? Can you measure contraction? So to do that, we went back to our substrate, our soft and elastic substrate. But we also made the surfaces sticky. So what you can do now is take your slice and just slap it onto your substrate. And when you do that, they stay in place. You can look through. You can look at lumen, so that's the, the, uh, the airway. You can look at your airways. But in the experiment, when you add your contractant, 
not only can you look at airways, but you're also looking at how these beads move in response to contract. And from there, you can get the contractile forces. So with, with contraction, you can see uh, with a constrict, sorry, with a contractile agonist, you can see how the lumen starts from here, becomes smaller. Correspondingly, the forces in the muscle go bigger. Then you add a relaxant compound, that lumen re-expands. And correspondingly, the airway smooth muscle cell forces go down. So you can measure this directly with this approach. And we can do this in 12 well, so in, in, in medium throughput formats. Let me show you now some average data done many lungs and you know many different uh, uh, lungs and slices. On, the, on this axis is change of contractile force. And on this axis is change of the lumen area as a function of time. This has been in response to treatment with acetylcholine, which is a contractile agonist. So when you add it, the lumen area in gray becomes smaller. So the area is narrowing. Correspondingly, the forces go bigger and bigger and bigger. Next, we add a relaxant compound. You can see that the lumen area becomes bigger and bigger. Corresponding, the forces go smaller and smaller. But when you look at these side by side, you already will appreciate that these force measurements are less variable from airway to airway as compared to measuring changes of area shape. We were next curious about sensitivity. And to do that, we took human lung slices and treated them with increasing doses of histamine. This is also a contractile agonist. And this axis is change of contractile force, this axis change of lumen area. Focus particularly on these small histamine doses. What you observe is that for these small doses, the lumen area change, you don't see anything, but the force is already substantially higher. So what we learned from this is these tissue traction microscopy measurements are more sensitive to bronchoconstrictor stimuli. And finally, remember this method of tissue traction microscopy gives you not just a single number, but you get maps of forces. So for example, here's an experiment where we took a human lung slice, first added methacholine, you can see the nice contraction increase of force. Then we added formotrol, which is a relaxant, the forces go down. Then we stretched it, so you get a fluidization response and a resolidification response. But remember, for each one of these dots here, I have not just an average force value, but I have a map like this. So what I can do is, in those maps, I can zoom in and look at a hotspot, region with big force, and I can get a nice time trace of how things happened. I can look at a cold spot and see a time trace of how things happened. And that's important because you really get a sense of what's underneath this heterogeneity, structurally, biochemically. We can zoom in on these hot spots and then study simultaneously structure and biochemistry, what's there in that local area smooth muscle region that is causing it to hypercontract. So this method then has this ability to both spatially and temporally resolve forces. So then I've described to you two approaches for bronchodilated drug discovery, the method of contractile force screening. This uses cultured cells and is fast, 96, 384 well plate. And I've also described to you the method of tissue traction microscopy. This uses lung slices, human, including human lung slices. And this is medium through, but at the moment we done them in six well, but we can expand them maybe 12 and 24. I submit that the combination of these methods, high throughput cultured cells, medium throughput slices is a balanced hit to validation approach in order to develop new bronchodilator, bronchodilator medications. So that's everything I want to say for the moment about um, uh, the lung, asthma, and airway smooth muscle. In the time I have left, I want to switch gears. I want to go from lung to the heart and to the specific disease settings of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. This is a rare disease it's associated with life-threatening arrhythmias. And it's characterized by cardiomyocyte dysfunction. Now, previous studies have discovered many mechanisms, including mutations at um, desmosomal or at adherence junctions, loss of gap junctions, mutations in cytoskeletal proteins within the cardiomyocyte, which is the heart cell, there's mutations in the cytoskeletal genes, or defects in calcium, signaling calcium sensing within cells or between cells. But I, my team, we wondered, but what about the contractile forces themselves? How do these diseased, how much, how fast, how frequently, what about the force patterns in these diseased cells? To answer this question, we brought this approach of contractile force screening to this disease setting. 
we focused on Excuse me, I'm wondering if we are still online. Yes, we mm. are. Do you hear me? I think we lost the connection. I mean, that's that's one of those little... That's the first time it has happened. So uh, if you don't mind, we will get in touch with Dr. Krishnan at the moment. And maybe he will be able to uh, reconnect to us, please. Yes, we lost the connection. That's what we see. Uh, I would like to invite everyone to wait just one minute. Um, can I ask my team to get in touch very quickly through email or other any other method with Dr. Krishnan, please? That's what we need to do. Okay, I hope we will get in touch in a minute with Dr. Krishnan. Uh, but at the moment, I would like you all to remember that you can ask your questions through this chat box. I think we will be back online in one or two minutes. I just need to get in touch again through uh, to, with uh, Dr. Krishnan, please. So, will you please wait one second? And I will get in touch with the researcher himself. Okay, please everyone stay tuned. I will take this opportunity, everyone, to advertise our next event, uh, just to let you know that uh, the A plus lectures is an event that is um, still developing. And uh, till this very moment, I think we have had already eight or nine lectures delivered by world class lect uh, lecturers, uh, scholars, researchers. What I would like to uh, emphasize is that you can find all the previous lectures. They are available online. Mm -hmm. When you go to our website, www.apsl.edu.pl, uh, and you find one of the current events, uh, you can just simply click on the YouTube uh, link and you will get to the lecture itself. But then you can find the playlist with all the other lectures that are available uh, online through YouTube channel. This is one possibility. The other possibility is to go to our website, which is again www.apsl.edu.pl. Uh, 
And through this website, you can also find the uh, one of our logos, which is Aktivna Akademia. Uh, and this is a program, a project, within which our a lectures are delivered. And once you get to appropriate tab, you can see all the previous lectures, you can go to the playlist, and you can also uh, download or watch one of those videos uh, that have uh, that has that have already be, uh, been been um, broadcast. Now, one of the things that I would like to say is that in two days we are meeting again. This time, we are meeting at six p.m. local time, Polish time, and uh, I would like to invite you to this special lecture, uh, which will be on literature, on Polish literature. So it's going to be in English, and uh, let me tell you that this event will not be available through YouTube. This event will only be available through uh, our click meeting platform. Now I can still see that we have some technical issues. And uh, if you do not mind, uh, just one more second, please. Szanowni Państwo, jeszcze tylko po polsku, dla Państwa mamy techniczne problemy. Jeżeli Państwo poczekają jeszcze chwileczkę z, z nami, prosimy nie opuszczać nas i naszego kanału. Jeżeli wszystko pójdzie dobrze, powinniśmy za kilka minut, za dwie, trzy minuty mieć odpowiedź, czy połączenie będzie jeszcze możliwe. W każdym razie, w, w razie innych problemów i, i większych problemów technicznych, Szanowni Państwo, postaramy się dostarczyć Państwu wiadomość, czy przekażemy Państwu wiadomość, w jaki inny sposób ewentualnie będziecie mogli Państwo wysłuchać tego, tego wydarzenia. Mam nadzieję, że uda się dokończyć jednak dzisiejsze spotkanie i będziemy mogli jeszcze dzisiaj uczestniczyć w tym spotkaniu z Panem doktorem Krishnanem z Medical School Harvard, z Harvardu. Szanowni Państwo, bardzo z, znana osobistość. Czekamy na ponowne połączenie. Mamy, mamy pierwsze wiadomości, że że jakieś są problemy techniczne, szanowni Państwo, ale nie wiemy, czy one jeszcze, czy da się jeszcze rozwiązać. Prosimy, żeby Państwo zostali jeszcze chwilę z nami. So, ladies and gentlemen, please, uh, I would like to ask you for a little bit of patience. I mean, we have at the moment some technical issues, so if you can wait just for two more minutes, three more minutes, we will know if this technical glitch that has occurred uh, will uh, be solved and will be able to proceed. But if not, then we will let you know uh, what, uh, in what way, or what will be the mode of this lecture later on. So maybe we will be able to deliver this lecture, I mean, this re the recording of the lecture probably later, And uh, but hopefully let's wait two, two or three minutes so that we will be able to probably um, continue. Please wait just one or two minutes. Bardzo przepraszam, bardzo poproszę pana Juliusza o dopuszczenie pana doktora do, do roli prezentera. Jest z nami na czacie.
once again, just like you did it uh, last time, Mr. Rama, try to turn on your camera back on. Oh, I was, can you hear me now? Excellent. Yeah. Oh, what a shame. Yes. I was talking. I was talking and talking, and I didn't realize I was disconnected. Oh. All right. I mean, it's probably, uh, we're sorry, I tried to get in touch with you through uh, Messenger and everything else, uh, and, and the email as well, but obviously you I was. You, you, you were presenting. I was going to the <laughs> so we're really, we're really sorry. I think we 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 have been offline. For, I mean, you have been offline, in fact, for seven minutes, I guess. So okay, so you got most of it. You got no, it. no, no, no. Can, can could, could you could we somehow you know go back if you have just a little bit more time? So oh we... yeah, as much time as you like. I can repeat. Yes. It again. So I will tell you which slide it was because I was sure. really paying attention to to, to, sure. My to, to the lecture. Sure, my No, I mean it's probably just a technical glitch. I, we don't really know what happened. So, and um, we're really sorry. I mean that this happened uh, probably oh, no in the, maybe the internet yeah. connection. Can you just upload the the presentation now? Absolutely. Again? But I wonder yes. where we start. Is this? Uh, were you able to observe these uh, slides? Um, are these uh, all right i can i'm now sharing but can you move through slides yourself by the way i will i will go to the slide that was i was uh, excuse me okay sure, sure. Oh, you're no, no 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 wait wait wait, 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 wait. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up from there i think this was that was here you can also share your screen rama uh, it was here. Okay, so we went quite far. Okay, so let me pick up from here. Let me pick up from where that is. I think uh, so. I uh, mean, uh, you let. It's I okay. Mean, you know, I, we have it. We have it open this, on the screen. I'll just this was the one. Out. Yes, that that was exactly this slide. This was exactly this slide. So if you can start from this moment on, sure. just just sure please thing. continue. Sure sure. I'm really happy. I'm really happy that people stayed. So we have some people online and people on YouTube awesome. also stayed. Thank you awesome. very much for for this. Can you navigate through the slides yourself, Rama, now? Sure. Um, just try to navigate because I, I shared the uh, the presentation myself, but can you can you just change slides or not really? Yes, you um, can. I'm okay. able to, but I'm not able to play the movies, but that's okay. Okay, uh, so I'm no, just, no, 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 no. I, that's okay. I, will, I, 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 I don't have very many more movies. I'll go straight but, to it. So... Uh, okay. What I wanted to say was we brought this method of contractile flow screening to these to the disease settings of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, and I'm showing you. Um, and to do that, we focused on uh, we focused on stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. What we did is we compared control cells with disease cells, and we directly measured the contractile force development. And I'm showing you on I'm showing you in, in the left representative um, contractile force maps. This is at over 10 seconds. And on the y-axis is the contractal forces that they uh, generate. These are two representative maps. And here is averages over many different cells and many different dishes. And what we learned was on average, these disease cells produce far weaker contractions and slower contractions. So they beat the magnitude is smaller and the frequency is also smaller. Um, now, we wondered, well, that's contractile forces that they develop upon their substrate. But if you recall in the earlier slide, I mentioned that in this disease, the previous literature has identified importance of intercellular forces and transmission. So we wondered, what about intercellular stresses? And to do that, I have to teach you one additional method, this method called monolayer stress microscopy. So far in everything I've told you, we were focused on forces at the bottom contractile forces on the substrate. So it turns out, if you know these forces, or if you know the forces at the feet of these tug of war players, you can then calculate what is the balancing stresses in either the cell monolayer or in this the example in the tug of war in the, in, in the rope, just Newton's third law. If I know these, I can compute the balancing stresses either in the rope or importantly in our setting in the case of the cell monolayer. So we did that. And what we observed for our, oops, and for our cell monolayer, this was a representative map we obtained for the uh, control cells, the non-disease cells. Immediately, you appreciate 
a very heterogeneous landscape. You have some regions with a lot of force. That's the big red blobs, regions of big force. And some regions with no force, a very heterogeneous in a monolayer. This is the map corresponding to that monolayer. So you can see a very heterogeneous distribution of stresses amongst cells. And you also see these stresses piling up. This is approximately that, which is approximately, you're talking 20, 25 cells. And on average, this you can quantify through what's called a correlation length. So for this image, these stresses are correlated over approximately 85 micron. Now, this is for the controls. In the diseased cells, not only is the magnitude smaller, but the correlations are also smaller. So what we've learned is these disease cells transmit less stress, and this is spread over fewer cell cell junctions. Now you're probably wondering, why is that? What's going on? And to do this, I need to review the literature. And an important paper is the one from Dr. Jeffrey Saffitz from my program at Beth Israel Deaconess Harvard Medical School. His group discovered that these arthmogenic cardiomyocytes by themselves are pro-inflammatory. They can produce factors. For the moment, only look at the red bars versus the blue bars. Red is disease cells, blue is control cells. Pick your favorite cytokine, IL-13, IL-17, you know, interferons. Every case, you can see that the diseased cells are producing far more inflammatory factors than control cells. Another piece of evidence is work from um, Dr. Deepa Kanigrahi's lab, also in my program. They study mice and they study mouse models of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And what they did is they recovered hearts from a controlled mouse and the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy bearing mouse. And they looked at markers of resolution of inflammation. Resolvins, meracins, these are standard markers. What they observed was in each and every case, diseased mice developed less of this res inflammation resolution um, markers. That is to say that when you look at these two important piece of evidence, what we learn is disease cells produce more inflammatory factors, but they also fail to resolve their inflammation. So from this, we hypothesized that, um, from this, we hypothesized that resolving cardiomyocyte inflammation will also resolve cardiomyocyte contractile dysfunction. Test this hypothesis, we considered control and diseased cells. We treated them both with a pro-resolution compound, and then we measured force development the next day after 24 hours. And what we observed was striking. Just look at the red bar, which is the contractile forces developed by diseased cells. Compare it to the pink bar, which is the contractile forces developed by disease cells after treatment with the, uh, uh, with the uh, inflammation resolution compound. You can see that the force development is restored. And not just that, if you looked at the intercellular stresses, compared to control, uh, compared to disease, you can see that the treated cells look very much like control cells. So this then has encouraged us in ongoing studies, we're, we're finding novel inflammation resolution therapies to treat contractile, uh, contractile uh, um, uh, cardiomyocyte dysfunction in this disease set. This was work done in the last year, lots of COVID related delays, and yet my postdoc um, accomplished it, but there is still work to be done. This is, so this is still very preliminary. We're looking at additional patient derived lines, primary cells, whole animal measurements, and all this is ongoing. We're also looking at what's behind these responses, the molecular scale, who are the, the key players in this response? And we're looking at additive effects of disease settings, fibrosis, substrate stiffening, and so on. In conclusion then, I've described to you novel methods to study biomechanics. And I have generalized, well, I've, I've rather, I've applied these methods, the settings of airway smooth muscle cells and asthma and cardiomyocytes in the setting of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And I'm delighted to report that these biomechanical assays and studies have actually led to the development of new drugs. Um, so I want to conclude by saying, don't underestimate the force. With that, I'll conclude. I want to acknowledge members of my lab, um, my collaborators, funding sources, and thank you for the attention. And apologies again for this, uh, for the delay, and thank you for staying, staying on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rama, for uh, delivering this interesting lecture. And, and I hope uh, you have all 
learned a lot from this lecture. I mean, let me remind you that uh, the lectures are available online. So, I mean, even if we lost the connection, I mean, they are recorded, so you can access them through our YouTube channel and also the playlist. Rama, thank you so much again. And uh, lots of, and many thanks to your team. And uh, uh, I mean, those acknowledgements that you mentioned are really uh, important again, because they are part of the team and part of the team changing the world, in fact. Now, um, I would like to invite questions at the moment. I mean, you can ask those question use, uh, questions using the chat box. And also you can use chat on our YouTube channel. So we're waiting for some questions. But in the meantime, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, now, how long does it take? I mean, probably it's not really, uh, it's not really connected so so much to the topic itself, but maybe it goes beyond the study. And, but I mean, it's important because you, you, you say you develop new drugs, obviously, and uh, the, that's sometimes, you know, drugs are life changing. We know that from this current situation around the world. Uh, but I mean, how, mu how much time uh, does it take for the drug to be uh, legally uh, approved and then become marketable? Right. Right. So here's the standard life story of a drug. Uh, first story is called preclinical studies. Everything I showed you is preclinical. It's done in labs where you do high throughput screening validation studies. You use mouse models, human tissues, human cells, but it's not still in the human. So that's the first stage, preclinical. So it turns out 30%, up to 30, 40%, 30% 30 of drugs already fail in preclinical, right? So that's one step. Next step is called phase one. You you, 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 you do these safety studies in human, right? That's called phase one. You're not looking at, those are typically non-diseased people. You use dose, but you just want to know it's well tolerated. The next step is called phase two, where you do uh, dose finding studies. Phase three is the actual efficacy study. So typical lifespan of a drug from start to finish, 11 years. <laughs> okay. And failure rate, 96%, just mm -hmm. so you know. So <laughs> most drugs start and then they keep failing through many of these processes all the more reason why assays like this are so important you know from uh, uh, which i wanted to to, to to mention is so this method uh, 30 percent to 40 percent fail at the very first stage of preclinical discovery mm -hmm. that's because you want a drug to relax the muscle cell but if you cannot measure it properly you're developing a drug that might be super duper but it may not relax the muscle cell ultimately so the, the so the rationale that I've been following is well, if that's what you want to do, measure it at the very beginning, mm -hmm. and you know. So there are so in fact all over the world, lots of assays. Um, you th there is more and more recognition that you would it, that it is helpful to study the phenotype already at the early stage rather than the target. The the drug has to work through you know this particular pathway this. That pathway might all be great, but it may not ultimately relax the muscle. So it's not mm -hmm. ultimately beneficial. So there is mm -hmm. now importance of assays like what I described to you, where you can directly measure the phenotype. So when we hear about the drug being experimental, it's probably in phase three already. Well, I so if when you talk about experimental drugs, uh, it could be in the clinical trial in phase three. Yeah, that, that could well be the case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other thing that uh, you may know of is there is, and that, that was the case for COVID too, is if you are, a, and I'm not a doctor, but I'm talking about, you know, experience I've gained. Um, so don't quote me on everything I'm going to say, but that if you are in the emergency room, you're, you're catering to a patient, the patient is at the end, nothing is working. They can use something called emergency use authorization. They can just pick out a safe drug and just administer it to the patient, even though you've not done a, you know, a full safe, you know, a full profile, um, you know, in one form or the other. So there is that pathway as well. You can short circuit the 11 years to being shorter and doing experimental therapeutics, if you will. Mm -hmm. But um, there are some avenues like that. But typically, experimental drug implies, yep, it's still in phase three, uh, undergoing. Okay. Uh, that's my mm -hmm. understanding. I still cannot see questions. Thank you for answering this question. First of all, I cannot see the uh, questions coming in. So I have my other question and probably it will, will be the final question. Um, 
I mean, is there any role of computers, I don't know, artificial intelligence in the future, algorithms to simulate the situations you mentioned? Mm -hmm. So, in fact, much of the analysis, um, when I tell you I can go from this to that, is all done at the moment cloud computing. We, we work with, you know, um, um, there, in fact, is opportunity here in... So, so let me let me simplify this further. So it's one thing to think about therapeutics. It's another thing when I men mentioned these mechanical force generation, development, transmission, this is an area of medicine at the mo uh, called cell mechanics. It, it's part of cell biology. It's a very actively pursued field. Lead investigators, in, including in Poland, who study um, you know, the ability of cells to contract, the ability mm -hmm. of cells to migrate. You used the word proliferation at the beginning of the lecture. Very important biological feature of a cell. And they try to tie these to fundamental molecular pathways within cells. So an assay like this reveals the mechanical forces. But you have to realize under the hood, there's like hundreds of thousands of interactions amongst different molecular pathways. And an urgent need, and, an, and uh, uh, this is a big effort these days, is connect them. And for this, you need some amount of artificial intelligence. You need some amount of machine learning. This can do this, can do that. This phenotype change can do this. You know, and and and, and that's actually, um, you know, uh, in pharma, they often use assays like cell painting, where they look at cell, five different characteristics of um, five measurements from which they infer about thousand characteristics of cell shape changes learn how that happens normal versus disease correlate that to molecular function correlate that to um, you know changes of biology so it, it is actually a big deal in this general area of cell mechanics and, and molecular biology so you would say that the future for uh, the use of computers is really bright i mean in that well, it's it's, in, it's indispensable at the moment but it will become even more indispensable probably in the future with computer power getting really really absolutely. high I mean, yeah. absolutely Gotcha. Okay, I still cannot see uh, any more questions. So let me thank you once again, Rama, for mm -hmm. this interesting, insightful lecture. And I, I'm, I'm interested in particular in asthma. I mean, I have a family history of that. Not myself, but I mean, there is a family history in my family running. So uh, uh, it's of interest. And uh, I definitely remember that particular part and uh, everything else so i learned a lot thank you i hope everybody as well has learned a lot and uh, thank you for just uh, accepting this invitation and thank let you. me and let me invite everyone to our next lecture in two days and it's going to be on the 18th of november at uh, six this time at 6 p.m or so time and the title is adam mitzkevich and uh, humanism and it will be, the lecture will be delivered by Jürg Schulte of the University of Cologne. Uh, so uh, let me let me say good night and goodbye now at the moment, and see you in two days. Hopefully, if you want some more information about our pro program, please visit our website www.apsl.edu.pl. Thank you once again, Rama. Lots of greetings. Sending you all the best. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Goodbye and good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.